Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I have a very special treat for you today. I am back down here in Pullman, Washington. You might remember Jason. Uh, we had the video about uh, Columbia River Basin agates yep. that we did, which was a lot of fun. However, we're in a slightly different space. So I think what we're gonna do today is we're gonna take a tour of your new rock shop, the Brain awesome. Body Balance Rock Shop here in Pullman. Yep. And it's a better, it's, a, it's definitely a better location. It's very cool to see, yeah. I'm very excited for you. And then we're gonna maybe sit down and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about kind of the, this whole business of rocks. Yeah. And I think it'll be really helpful and really enlightening for people that are kind of interested in maybe doing what you do or a little bit about what I do. And awesome. we can kind of sit down and chat about it. But Sounds right great. now, Let's look at some of let's look at some of your rocks. Yeah, let's do it. This is a great space. So right away, I gotta say that the space in here, you're easily double. Are you th like you're yeah, double, double, double the old double, space yeah. <laughs> and uh, a nice parking lot and very good location. It would seem like. Yeah, great location. I'm right on Bishop in Pullman, and uh, I've actually got frontage along Bishop itself, which is one of the main roads here in Pullman, and I get a lot of natural light. Um, and there's a parking lot in front of the building and I have a room that allows me to process stones and things and kind of keep them out of the shop. So uh, all in all, even room for growth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah uh, I could see you could put some more shelves. You could do some stuff in here, pack yeah. some more rocks in. Yeah, always room for more, <laughs> no doubt about it. Yeah, well, uh, feel free to kind of follow me around and take a look. I can ex explain some of the things that are in the shop. So one thing that I've liked about what you do here is all of your little signs yeah i've gone to some rock shops and there's just no labels on anything no prices on anything and no information which i kind of get that i think what some people do is they do that so that they have a way of engaging with customers yeah which is good in theory until you have like four people in the store sure um yeah. so having uh all the little signs about like carnelian and different materials is kind of i kind of like that we do we do our best to have an interactive experience and if you're um, putting that at the forefront of your business plan you, then you definitely make efforts to do so i will say it's it's difficult to keep up with everything you know signs go missing and mm -hmm. things like that but we do our best and ultimately what i'm looking for is an interactive experience and concentrating on just having good interactions with people in the shop and everything else takes care of itself so that's one of the things we do yeah yep. crystals quartz crystals oh that was that that was really fun in particular i met the miners who have the claim um uh, uh, for that brilliantly clear quartz crystal all of this comes from arkansas it was mm -hmm. really fun to meet them and get that material in the shop this year beautiful stuff yeah ron coleman uh mine in arkansas ron coleman i Christmas. definitely want yeah. to go down to arkansas yeah there's yeah. all the, some of the some of the dig sites down there that yeah. are open for like fee digs yeah they're Amazing. one of them yeah yeah absolutely great people too I, I they were very approachable and and easy to talk to you got some um, beautiful smokies in here yeah yeah you know one of the things about my shop that we touched on last time too that's a little different than a lot of rock shops is we try our best to mine the majority of the material in the shop and we're still at over 50 percent now and we're fully stocked with material that mm -hmm. isn't ours so usually at no time during the year are we uh, under 50 percent self-collected um, and we have information about spots that folks can get to within a day or so uh, of this area which is really helpful a lot of people want to learn how to go out and and go rock hounding yeah, right i mean a, a lot of, i mean no offense to other shop owners, but a lot of shop owners try their very best to protect all of their sources for that, everything all There's the time. obvious reasons I mean, for that, but it's just a different business but model. So many people probably wouldn't <laughs> even say that they got the, their, like the quartz from the Ron Coleman mine. Yeah. Like me, I can tell that it's from Arkansas. Yeah. But saying that, I mean, yeah. you know. The, yeah. It, Transparency. Yes. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> so new display cases here. Yeah. Obviously part yeah, of yeah. the this kind of your center space. It is. Yeah. And, you know, things are constantly moving around, mm -hmm. but I try to put um, material that's somewhat themed together in different areas. Um, at times it's difficult and things kind of migrate around the shop. But um, but, you know, 
getting back to providing spots for people too you know basically m what i concentrate on when people come in is being a resource for them if they have questions about material they have or whether or not it might have come from you know i don't claim to be an authority or an expert but i'm getting more and more experience by the day and i'm willing to share what i've learned i think the so. rule is you can never call yourself an expert but other people can call you an expert. <laughs> fair enough <laughs> i think that's the way that works <laughs> <laughs> fair enough yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah okay so some self-collected material which yeah, that's always yeah. always beautiful to see yeah and i've rearranged a bit but most of this material that you're looking at right now is surface collection stuff from what we would call a placer claim in Idaho, and I have two of those. Beautiful. And the designation placer would mean that I have to collect material that is on the surface in the area that I have my claim. I can't go down under the ground and try to find the source of the material. Mm -hmm. A placer claim by design is a place where there's material that has moved into or floated to the surface and you're just collecting it on the top. So is it fair to refer to these as nodules then? Yes, because many, I mean, many of them are. You yeah. know, uh, it's coming out of like basalt. Yep. Okay. Yep. And there yeah. was a pocket in that basalt and there's many, many different ways in which these minerals form, even ones that look very similar, right? Yeah, I mean, there's they can a, form very a lot of a lot of your stuff here. Like, there's multiple events happening, oh, you yeah. know, with like. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so we have some like fortifications. We got quartz crystals. We have water lining, mm -hmm. all in the same. Even piece. calcite, a big pocket oh, of hey. calcite. Yep. Yeah, absolutely very complex. Is any of the calcite that you found UV reactive? M much of it. Much? Oh, that's mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, and I'm working on a little UV section. I got it, I've got it a little closer to ready, but still not quite we'll, gone. We'll have to come back <laughs> and see your UV <laughs> <Yeah>. display. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> great, yeah. Always a new thing to do. Yeah, beautiful yep. stuff. Yeah, and this is, there, there might be one or two things on these shelves that mixed in mm -hmm. uh, just for price convenience, but uh, Almost all of this comes from my plaster claims in Idaho. And here's some of the the keepers for you, the person, yeah. the personal collection. Yeah, lots of water polished agates. I, I'm partial to water polished agates. Um, I collect all kinds of things, but I, I really have a soft spot for um, for agates that have been pre-polished. I like your uh, repurposing of a candle holder there. That's a candle holder, Oh yeah, holder, right? <laughs> absolutely is. I find, in fact, if you look on top, I have some other really okay. amazing, <laughs> that's a little, uh, a little hack for your watchers. I, you know, I might, you I can, might steal that, that you display You can find idea. some like amazing that. candle holders <laughs> in, in secondhand stores for next to nothing. Very cool. Yeah, here I'm happy yeah. to move this too. Got some kyanite up there. Yeah. Beautiful material. Yeah. I'm either uh, sentimentally co uh, connected to the things in my little case here, or they're super unique, right? Mm -hmm. You know. So. Oh, more kyanite. Yeah. Yeah, a few pieces up there. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. Uh, far larger than the kyanite that I found in Idaho. The, yeah. the stuff I found in Idaho, it's like yeah, teeny the, tiny. This is beautiful, though. Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Yeah. I. Um, I have gotten a little more diverse material uh, from this latest trip to Arizona for the shop. And I've really kind of redesigned some of my business plans. You know, we'll probably touch on yeah. that when we talk about um, markets and, and businesses mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, I'm anxious to I imp deploy my new plans, <laughs> you know. Um, I, I really hope to move a lot of the material that I'm mining um to wholesale um uh, as wholesale material mm -hmm. to resellers and so that's part of my new plans but but lots of fun things Very for cool. folks affordable right you know uh five ten dollar items that you can grab two or three of and heck for 20 mm -hmm. bucks you can get you know three or four real nice samples which of minerals that, that's and, very cool to have especially being that this is a college town mm -hmm. which means you have like a big spectrum of for sure in, like incomes yeah. of the people that are here yeah and really um, if a person is using the material for meditation or something like that, if they're trying to connect metaphysically to the frequency mm -hmm. of the mineral, then they don't necessarily need a big showpiece, right? Um, and so a lot of people are interested in that these days, and you don't necessarily need a big expensive piece if you just want to have uh, some frequency work with the mineral. So.
Can we see your back spaces that are still in progress? Oh, of course we can, yeah. Yeah, let's go through. There's always fun little things hidden here and there. I've got items around on the floor and things as well that you'll find. So there's a lot of fun things to do in here. I encourage people to come in just for fun. It's it's probably not a real rock shop if there's not at least a couple of things on the floor, <laughs> right? So this is kind of like a, a work in progress space. I see that you, yeah. have, you have rough, I assume bins of rocks? Yeah, so this is gonna be part of my new business plan. And the materials that I mine, I'm gonna have available in rough form and in wholesale amounts in lots for other resellers. And then I'm also gonna slice up a lot of the material and have it in slabs for people to work on in lapidary form. So it'll be sliced up rough that I'll have by the pound. And then I'm also going to employ all of that onto my website and sell from there as well. I, I know so many people that are in the market for a big slab saw, but are priced out yeah. or can't even find a good used saw. So being able to sell slabs, I think, is really smart. When I went to Arizona, it seemed to be some of the biggest feedback I got was the materials great but I can't really work with it. I just have the ability to do a little trim saw mm -hmm. and some polishing, or I just have a tumbler. Uh, I just have a flat lap, you know, and that's where most people are. Well, and so they can't take a big stone and yeah. do anything the, with The it. price of a big saw yeah. today, a used saw that probably needs a bunch of work is about $100 an inch. So you're getting a 14 inch saw, yeah. which you can cut, what, like a five, inch rock less on. than half the diameter yeah less for than sure. half the diameter yep. that's yeah. going to have problems and you just spent fourteen hundred dollars on a problem and you're definitely going to need to work on that saw so as you go mm -hmm. and replace bearings and troubleshoot things that aren't aligned anymore because they've shimmied out yeah. of alignment <laughs> yeah. and and that's used again you yeah. know yeah so yeah so you know uh, be able to have some slabs so people can just get a little trim saw absolutely and do some work is pretty cool and for, for instance, here's some of my oh, purple beautiful. material with uh, the quartz in the middle and then the edges. And I've, I've prepared it in different ways, of course, for different people. So on this one, I actually cut it long ways. A person could make several cabs or mm -hmm. earring sets and go into this face rather than using... Um, using the oh, cross you got, section, yeah bins so. and bins over here oh we sure do yeah and the moss is is really fun too i'll grab one that's wet here oh the beautiful it's amazing it's it's really really fun to find and cut into you don't really know what's going to be in there and i like your storage clam yeah storage this, is clam. Great. I, I, this is a repurposed uh <laughs> dish from a deli that went out of business i like, and... I like it <laughs> let's see your other so then you have do you know what the space was before you moved in oh gosh I couldn't have been more than 10 by 15. Well, no, uh, no, no, this actual space, what, what oh, business was it? Oh, in here. Yeah. It had been vacant for a very long time. Because this kind of looks like it could have been like a little break room. It definitely area. was. The, over the years, there have been many businesses in here, but for some reason, there was an extended period of time where it was vacant. I believe that the building was changing owners, and the and I don't really know the details, but for some reason, it was a vacant space, and so it worked out perfect for me. This is been a absolutely <laughs> a, a amazing for using cupboard space and cleaning and being able yeah. to dry things out and um and, and uh it's been it's been perfect in terms of using it for processing stones you can kind of see couple, i just couple, roughly have things got laid a couple out of tumblers going here yeah i've got a real big one down oh here oh my god that is actually a homemade one yeah and and it's uh it's one that i had to kind of rebuild <laughs> And so it's got some, like this is a bottle cap I'm using <laughs> to keep the drum from hitting. And But you, you, do, what, cool. you do what you got to do. <laughs> okay, so I see a bunch of Harbor Freight tumblers. Yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How, what's your experience been? Because people seem to have a love-hate relationship with these things. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, you turn them on and they run consistently for four years or you pull it out of the box and it's broken. Oh, yeah, it's hit and miss. So, uh, I think they don't. This is again my experience, and I can't. I, I don't. I don't really know uh, what the details are in terms of me talking about another business, but I can just explain what my experience has been with these particular units. Yeah. Right. So, I've purchased many of them, and you're gonna know because of the nature of of Harbor Freight. Y you should know at least going in that it it 
it could go out the first day, but like you said, it might run for a really long time. Mm -hmm. I think they understand that. They know what, what, what they are, right? And what mm -hmm. service they provide. And so they don't have a problem with that. If it goes out right away, they just swap it out in store. And yeah. that's been my experience. You can also buy a warranty for it which after a couple of years you know you've you've worn down into the metal and it's wobbly but still going and, and you just go in and swap it out you know so personally for the price if you know what you're getting into and you're willing to go back to the store mm -hmm. if you need to um my experience is they work with the customer really well so i have nothing but good things well, to say or, or you just you just build build yeah. your own i mean uh, yeah re realistically yeah. the rock <laughs> if you, ha if you have too. the barrels right if you have the barrels the actual tumbling part is like such a basic basic it mechanism sure yeah. it's hard though to replace a good rubber barrel like yeah. you can't there's yeah. not like an easy yeah nice thing i've ever came across it's not it, it's not easy to make something that will work well yeah i mean i've seen know, the yeah, yeah. things will be people will be like use pvc or like the plastic coffee <laughs> and cans they spend and weeks like, troubleshooting ah, their prototypes you know <laughs> well man this yeah. is great oh, to see thank you i'm also bringing a plant back to life over there in the, in the corner <laughs> a little so. plant, plant rehab yeah we're working on it and Ooh. today has, has been a better day for you that got some plant, material so. down there as well yeah well i think uh maybe we could sit down and we could uh chat a little bit more about some of these business aspects sounds great i'm interested one thing that happens every single week for me is I get about one to two emails from people mm -hmm. and it goes a little something like this. I want to start selling rocks or I'm going to retire soon yeah. and I want to buy a cab machine and I want to make and sell cabochons or mm -hmm. I want to have a mineral claim and then sell all the rocks from that. And that's kind yeah. of like my retirement plan or my backup plan and i can't really help these people a whole lot because i don't sell rocks i don't sell rocks i don't have a mineral claim i don't do jewelry things like that outside of just my own kind of personal yep. use so i very unhelpful but i have worked for myself for a very long time which mm -hmm. kind of i know enough about working for myself to know that people generally don't know how complex it is to you know if you've always been an employee it can be really hard yeah. so i wanted to come down and talk to you about this because awesome by all measures i would say you've been very successful in the rock world mm -hmm. you've had a physical shop you yep. upgraded the physical shop mm -hmm. you've done online sales you've gone to rock shows and set up to mm -hmm. sell mm -hmm. you own multiple mineral claims yep. that you personally work extract material wholesale resale or retail, mm -hmm. um, am I missing something? No, I, you know, that was pretty cool to hear you say all that. It's <laughs> happened pretty quick. And so honestly, I've really been following my passion and I'm in a unique position to be able to do that. So yeah, I have done all of those things. Um, and uh, we, I've been really lucky to be able to do all of that. Can I ask what you were doing before this? Yeah, absolutely. I was immediately preceding um, this job i was selling real estate and doing some sport fishing professionally um, catching b a bounty fish actually that so you get paid for definitely self-motivated uh, for sure i've been self-employed to one degree or another for around 15 years now mm -hmm. um, just finding one way or another to make 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 money you know and i had a commercial fishing boat in alaska and things like that right? and i think that's one factor that a lot of people don't consider if you go from working for other people your whole life mm -hmm. this idea of having to do it all yourself is totally totally new to people as mm -hmm. opposed to just kind of like you slowly dip your toes in it over time yeah um so yep. that's a very big factor i think when it comes to the sell, selling of, time. of rocks. The time that is involved. So here's a perfect way to encapsulate what I'm thinking of right now that touches on what you just said. People always say, when you love what you do, you don't work a day in your life. And I get the idea behind that, but honestly, it isn't true. Yeah. If you love what you do, you work twice as hard as everybody else because mm -hmm. you love it. How, how many hours a, how many hours a week do you think you work 70 plus I, I do about the same yeah yeah like I'll be answering mm -hmm. emails at 5 a.m and 7 p.m if I put a clock on it there's no doubt 
I'm at 70 plus every week. I, I could definitely make more money doing something else. Mm -hmm. And I would assume you as well. Like there's other career paths that you could. Lots of ways for, for people to make money. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of ways. Um, it's as much about loving what you do or finding something that allows you to live in a way that you enjoy living, right? A lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. It, it, it really is um, fishing, farming, um, you know, being in the mineral world, um, being someone who owns a YouTube channel and makes a living that way, right? Mm -hmm. These are all things that you do because you love doing them. Um, and you wouldn't be successful if you didn't love it. I agree. It, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah um, I do have some questions that awesome. I both kind of prepared myself and um, I've fielded a couple of questions from other people that are Great. kind of interested in what what you do. Um, so you're doing a brick and mortar store here. Mm -hmm. Is that that's like the primary uh, means of like making money? Yeah, for, generating income for the business. Because yeah, you, you sure. do you have done shows like rock and gem shows, mm -hmm. but you're I mean, at best what, a couple of year? Yeah, two two years probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just maybe a little over two years, but around two years. So it's been, it's happening fast. And I've sort of sampled different techniques for the material that I've collected. Um, and uh, I have um, upgraded the store because mm -hmm. Pullman has been wonderful to my business. The college community here has really embraced what I'm doing. And so I needed a bigger space. So mm -hmm. I was very fortunate to do that. Uh, the shows that I've tried to do require a lot of effort. And I think a lot of the people that do shows kind of focus on doing shows and they enjoy moving around, traveling, mm -hmm. they enjoy the lifestyle. There's, a sh there's like a show circuit. Sure, absolutely. And you, you can see the same vendors at yeah, them. Yeah, what, yeah. what shows have you done? Um, I, recently, I just did the Pueblo Gem and Mineral, uh, excuse me, the Pueblo Gem and Mineral Show in Tucson. Mm -hmm. um, a very long running, um, uh, held in pretty high esteem show, it's, it, it's regarded uh, well during the Tucson show and and um, I had never even been to Tucson to go to any of the shows and so um, I, I got a little bit of of, a, of an odd look by most of the folks who were there as vendors who'd been doing it for decades mm -hmm. minimum um, and they're like this is your first show ever you know and and so that's one of the, th the ways I kind of do things if I'm going to do it I make a decision to do it and then I go for it. So, the Tucson show. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you think that the it was a big one. <laughs> the rock and gem shows generally are a good move for people to go and do if they're, you know, because there's a big range of vendors at shows, Absolutely. and I, I kind of have noticed the ones that are, at least to me, seem to be the most successful, mm -hmm. and they're the ones that show up with a lot of material that's sourced regionally mm -hmm. as opposed to. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have a wholesaler selling you everything that could be coming from India and China, and that's your your spread, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. But having things that you mind yourself, having yeah. Yeah. a big diversity, really, I think, brings people into those booths. And I mean, so if, you, if you kind of go to a show and you see where people are kind of gathering around, yep. that that I think that's a good indication of that you. you have to put in the work to have a big spread at shows. Mm -hmm. And here's here's where we dive in a little deeper to some of these topics that I find super interesting that you get asked questions about a lot, like markets. So you have to wrap your head around this idea around a market. And what I mean when I say that is, you can have lots of material that's worth a certain amount of money and it is worth that much money. Even some material has a market value that's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. But unless someone is willing to buy it from you, it isn't worth anything. So that's the second side of the coin. So a market isn't just the material. You have to have a buyer willing to buy it yeah. who is 
somehow able to get that material from you. And the reason I explain that is when you go to a show, you have to wrap your head around what your market is at that show. If it's a regional show, let's say, let's say if you stay in this region that we're in and you don't really go beyond the Northwest, you know, maybe a Tri-Cities show is a big show for you. Mm -hmm. You know, there's gonna be a lot of people and a lot of vendors. And so your market for you, if that's a big show, is, is local people from the Northwest who are probably interested in a lot of the stuff you're talking about. However, when I went to Tucson, the entire world was in Tucson to look for minerals. It was a much different scenario mm -hmm. and the market was different. The people who were there to purchase were different people than I would find in the Northwest. They necessarily, 80, 90% of those people weren't necessarily interested in me being connected to the material. However, the 10 or 15% of the people who did think that mattered they spent a lot of time in my booth and that was my market at mm -hmm. that show. And so it gets a little interesting what you bring to the table attracts different people and those buyers have different amounts of disposable income. And so you're really turning a lot of dials when you're talking about markets. It's not super straightforward. Are, are you thinking about going back and doing the Pueblo show again? Uh, I am it, thinking about it for sure. Um, based upon the past show that you did down mm -hmm. there, what do you think you would do differently? Or is it like bringing different material, setting up because it's it's a giant place, and you can have unimaginable. You could set up in different places. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. What was your takeaway from that? Uh, uh, most of the people who had experience w were very helpful in giving me feedback, and they said if you come back you really wanna to try to go back to the same exact spot you were in. There are so many vendors and it's so huge. People don't even try to go all over town most of the time. Mm -hmm. They'll pick one show, which basically means like a hotel or a venue, but there's venues all over the whole city. And so you go back and see people you've seen in years past and they need to know how to find you, otherwise they won't find you. And you'll end up having to build your market every single year if you switch places. That was something that was told was very important if I go back, right? You know, and that made sense to me. Um, I also learned that, like we talked about in the rough room earlier, um, the, the people needed the material sliced up. Mm -hmm. They were ready to buy it if it was in slabs, but otherwise it, it, was, it wasn't usable to them. So I would take a lot of that. Um, in Tucson, the buyers who came up at the big show that I was at, it was a two week show, um, they were either the same people who were coming into my rock shop, about 50% of those as normal consumers having fun at a rock shop a uh, rock show um, however i had the absolute most competition that i could ever have in the entire world there they could literally walk around within a hundred yards of me and find anything in the it's, world I, I, so, I, don't, I, I don't think people realize how big this these shows are like it's do you a, have an idea of the number of vendors no like had to be thousands there's and a, it's thousands a, it's of a, vendors. The whole Tucson area is taken over basically by a series of shows that are at different locations, mm -hmm. kind of with their own like little mm -hmm. overlap time periods. Yeah. And people go to Tucson that have shops themselves yeah. and will buy the next year plus of material that they need. Exactly so right. There's a lot of money changing hands yeah. and a lot of deals happening. Yeah. And that was the other half. I said 50% were, mm -hmm. were people like folks who come into my rock shop, only your prices had to be ultra competitive for them because of all, all of the, um, all of the supply. And then the other half of the people were rock shop owners and they were walking around with huge carts, purchasing lots of material mm -hmm. to fill inventory for their sh for their shops. And so I immediately realized, okay, if I'm going to bring lots of stuff down here from my mines, I have to change the way I approach selling it. I need to lower the price, detach myself from the material emotionally if I want to move it um, and sell lots of it. And you might say, well, why, why you have the material, why wouldn't you sell it all for full price? I could do that. I could sell a, a small amount at full market price over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. 
and that market would come to me and maybe I'd be able to build it a little bit and get full retail to a sliver of the overall world market. But I can mine 20 to 50 times more material than I can sell at full retail price. Yeah. It's worthless to me unless I find a market for all that material. Yeah. So that's where I have, drop the ro price. Rocks have zero and, value yeah. until there's an exchange of money for, yeah. the, for, for the material. And you know, speaking of claims a little bit, I know a number of people that think, or I've communicated with a bunch of people that think owning claims is a cakewalk, which it's not necessarily. And I, I, I've, <laughs> you're I've, literally digging ditches. <laughs> yeah, I've, you know, there's a lot to a lot involved in it. And just because you have a mineral claim, yeah, with maybe the best material, if you can't sell it, mm -hmm. you're just pulling rocks out of the ground yeah. and piling them up at your house. Yeah, and that's it, you know, so you really have to be very business orientated yeah. to be able to. Uh, extract minerals and, and sell them. And not only that, but an additional component to all those complexities is even if you can do all those things, it will take time. Yeah. So if you're not willing to commit years to developing this material and market mm -hmm. and a brand for this material, which is a whole nother topic we can get into, but um, it's a full commitment because it, it you can't do it halfway you'll never get anywhere what's the point and for most people mining claims and mineral claims aren't even necessary the only reason why they would need them is if they had a commercial operation mm -hmm. you're allowed to collect a lot for personal use and and you should look into the regulations of wherever the area is that you collect but they're usually very liberal for personal use collectors i'm going to drop some links down in the bottom of this video to the blm and mm -hmm. you can go do all of your own research on it because it is kind of a big complex issue and I don't disseminate legal advice here on the it's channel. So idea. you gotta, yeah. you gotta figure that yeah. out of your, out yourself. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, I think a lot of people get hooked on this idea of the only way you can be successful in having a rock business is to have a claim. Yeah. And I don't think that's the first step for a lot of people. I think that might be a, a little right. bit of a misstep. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the thing I would say about that is, I would say generally it, 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 it isn't going to be feasible even in the long term from a business standpoint, meaning it's not going to end up paying off or being operational in a, in a profitable way. And it's not going to be feasible in most circumstances unless you have such a unique material or something that's special enough that you can develop a brand for whatever it is that's unique about that material. It's gotta be something special because I, if it isn't, people are gonna be able to get it cheaper. I, I, I kind of think that minerals, that's a little bit easier to do. Like if you have a claim and you're getting world-class pyrites mm -hmm. out of it that's mm -hmm. a little easier mm -hmm. than if you uh have a thunder egg claim you know the the markets are different minerals versus rock for lapidary uses and yeah. there's definitely more jaspers yeah that are comparable to each other as opposed to you know yeah. uh a cool chrysocolla or wolfenite mine yeah. you know you know what's What's interesting though is I think even that is a little tricky conceptually because um, what I've also learned is even if I find something extremely rare that's pretty valuable mm. and special, I'm immediately in my mind thinking, oh, this is, this is different, right? So this is something special. It isn't necessarily easier to find a buyer for that material. Mm -hmm. It's harder. It, you have to find someone willing to spend a lot of money on something. And so even if there is an existing market like you're talking about, you've got to go there and take the thing there and compete against the other people who are doing that to try to actually get a buyer at that high price. And so, it, again, not as easy mm -hmm. as it sounds, even if you're finding special material. And to um, top it all off, you have to be... And have an understanding of taxes 
mm -hmm. paying fees for claims, mm -hmm. um, all of the associated costs with things, like, you know, um, display cases, power, business cards, mm -hmm. getting to know people, traveling, I, I have fuels. a $4,000 security deposit on my mining claim that I yeah. had to put down. Just, it's not even functional, functional usable money. Mm -hmm. It's literally a bond in case I leave the place a mess and disappear off the face of the earth, they can take my money and clean up. Um, and so, heck, I probably had fifteen to twenty thousand dollars of spent money, not counting time. That doesn't add in like, oh, I make twenty dollars an hour and I did all this time. I'm talking about actual currency that I had to spend on rentals and fuel to go back and forth to the claims. Um, it took eight months for me personally to get permitted to use heavy equipment on one of my claims. Um, two of my claims are placer claims, which are surface collected. Mm -hmm. One is a load claim, which is a different designation. And it took an additional eight months of time to navigate the permitting. I had to write an operational plan, which included um, all kinds of secondary plans for um, replanting the area and um, uh, for some reason, the terms escaped me at the moment, but for, for cleaning up and, and like reclamation, reclamation, yeah, that was it. Thank you. Um, and so the reclamation plan had to be very detailed uh, and included budgets and re replanting of vegetation. It included uh, environmental assessment periods, um, public comment at, um, at pub public meetings in the area. It included um, an artifact assessment where they had to w they walked around and determined whether or not there might be um, any cultural significant um, artifacts on the on the site. Not an easy process. You get well, the idea, you've right? Yeah. You've definitely sold me on not wanting a claim. I already, <laughs> did, I already didn't want one, but it, uh, that does not sound like the the fun time, in my my opinion. If you, I mean, I'm glad that you're doing it and able to like bring some of this cool stuff to market but like i don't want i don't want to do that it was complicated yeah. and if it wasn't worth it in the end if i wasn't mining a material that i had faith in personally that i knew over time i would be able to develop a market for this special stuff mm -hmm. there is no way i would still be going down this road um and even after almost two years of having this particular claim, starting with a pickaxe, coming across a vein of material that was unique enough that I went the next step, opened it up a little further, felt like it was mm -hmm. worth it to go. So this has been two years of small checkpoints to get to this point. I'm still operating on faith that what I've taken out will eventually overtake the costs in, in, in revenue that it mm -hmm. generates to pay for the operation. I'm still nowhere near after two years. And so that gives you an idea. That's just the reality of it. Most mines are gonna be not profitable for a long period of time until you get that market going and you get everything rolling. And that, that doesn't even really account for your hours. Not at all. You know, I mean, yeah, not at um, all. You start to do the math on it, yeah. like even yeah. e okay, it, just it, more broadly speaking, right? I feel like I've that, done doom and gloom. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, but it is difficult. But, but, and, but, but yeah, broadly yeah. speaking, if you run a small rock-related business or mm -hmm. own a claim, mm -hmm. um, be prepared to experience a significant amount of uh, loss or a long period of time where you're not generating a 40,000 a year mm -hmm. uh, income or a 60,000 or whatever. whatever because and even when you yeah. get there that's not that's your net you yeah. have to pay taxes still yeah and that's another thing that you know people yeah business people, owners people forget about business owners understand there's always an investment period mm -hmm. it's an investment i've been investing on faith for a couple years now 
not only did it require all of that, I had to have a couple of years time where I could still pay my bills mm -hmm. and function, right? That in and of itself weeds out over 90% of the people. How do you do something for years and not make money? Yeah, I, well, I think there's a, a unique so. type of person that has set themselves up in life that allows them to get by with a p lower income temporarily. Like if you have, yeah. if you're the type of person that you have a mortgage, two car payments on nice new cars, like a boat, a motorcycle, mm -hmm. uh, a vacation home, mm -hmm. and three kids, that's probably not the thing for you because you're not going to start doing this and be able to match that $80,000 a year yeah. uh, take home income from your corporate job. Like you're just not gonna be yeah. there. Unless it's the way you wanna live. Uh, and that's what we got back uh, to earlier. Yeah, but, yeah. Unless, but yeah. if you, yeah. Own your, you know, one, the most successful people that I have known, out, other than you at this, are generally kind of retired, you know? Yeah. They, they're not making big car payments. Mm -hmm. They own their houses. Their mm -hmm. kids have moved out. Mm -hmm. So their monthly income needs is significantly lowered over time. Maybe yeah. they have a pension or some 401k kind of paying out. Sh sure. And yeah, yeah. they can buy a cab machine, they can make some stuff and they can get that extra yeah. $300 a month and right. you know, selling on Etsy or whatever. And that's much more realistic for 90% of the people, which is most of the mm -hmm. people you probably get questions yeah. about. So touching on that, honestly, it's, it's a good idea. Really what I do is, is a massive life commitment, if I'm being mm -hmm. honest not for very many people not even possible but what is possible is what you were just talking about developing a line of something unique out of some material maybe you have a unique way of wrapping or you learn how to silversmith or you do something um, with leather and the material or you get the idea develop something that's a little unique and then you can brand it, mm -hmm. right? Um, or put a trade name on something that you're finding if it's unique. And, um, and then you can market it to a small market at regional shows and you can even develop a nice niche that way. So you don't have to go to the world and sell mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of pounds. Um, you know, that's a much more realistic model for people. And, um, you know, do you want to talk about trade trade names and branding? Love, a little? I would love to yeah. talk about trade names. So, for those of you who don't know, trade names are non scientific names that people apply to their material, mm -hmm. and they do it as a means of differentiating. Because it, it, if uh, I have a green jasper claim, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if I just call it Jared's green jasper, that that doesn't like. Yeah, ha, you know, have the oomph that's not that marketable, um, as opposed to if I call it Swamp Jasper exactly. or whatever, that sets you apart a little bit. Yeah. My kind of only real thought on it is I don't care for people doing that when it removes the source kind of name. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I, mean, if, I think if it's going to, if it's an egg, if it's a Thunder Egg, if it's a Jasper, kind of maybe include that a little bit. It gets super confusing, doesn't it? it, it and it, specifically what you're talking about is the difference between saying the name of a mineral and saying a trade name or a, a, a branded name mm -hmm. that someone has created or that everyone has agreed upon we're gonna use that isn't describing the type of mineral that it is or the name of the mineral. For instance, bloodstone. Everyone's heard of bloodstone. It's been around for eons. It's, it's referenced in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, so bloodstone isn't a mineral. It's not a mineral like um, citrine or topaz or emerald or um, quartz. You're talking about a mineral. You're just saying the name of the mineral. Bloodstone is a trade name that was developed for something really unique that people liked and they wanted to call it something, but it's a combination of minerals. It's mm -hmm. green chalcedony with red inclusions, really broad term. So there's lots of different stones that would fit under that trade name of bloodstone. So that can get confusing. Yes. Is, it, is it a bloodstone or isn't it? You know, and We can even get so. more confusing when claims or mines change hands and the exact same material now has a new name <laughs> attached to it. So, yeah. you know, uh, 
if I'm selling my green theoretical swamp Jasper mm -hmm. and you get that claim off of me and you don't like that name and yeah. you choose to rename it, well, there's going to be two exact same materials out on the market with two different names. Yeah. And yeah. as we go back through history, um, you know, I've been reading a lot of old magazines like Rock and Gem cool. magazines from the 70s, 60s, yeah. lapidary journals, and I they use trade names. And I'm like, I have no clue what they're talking about. Yeah. And you, there's no like uh, chart reference material of like historical trade names. Yeah, and it, it it doesn't survive the linear passage of time because that that little moment mm -hmm. in time died out and it became known as something else or whatever. And 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 in some ways, that's where rock clubs and stuff are good because you get somewhat of this oral uh, inclusion of. Uh, of information, but it also complicates things because in regions, people might all agree and in a different region, they might think they might agree on something else. And I'll often get people touching on what you said that will come in and say, do you have, um, and they'll say a name I've never even heard of, like, do you have serpentine agate? You know, and I'm mm -hmm. like, well, I don't know, describe it to me, you know, and they've heard of someone's yeah. stone that they branded and gave a name and they might be under the impression that it's an actual mineral name. So then when they come into the shop mm. and they ask for it, I may have the material, I may have the exact combination of minerals, but I don't know it as that name. Yeah, I mean, I think it's yeah. important to point out that <laughs> elements make minerals, minerals make rocks. And I think we're at like 6,300 recognized mineral uh, species. And then those make up a huge range of rocks that exist on a spectrum of purities. So yeah. it can really, really get complex. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like to say most of the material is actually outside of the box. You mm -hmm. know, when we learn it, we need to have specimens that are kind of neatly within boxes so that we can understand the differences. But out in the real world, it's usually somewhere in the middle, some mixture, con conglomerate of things. What do you think of the kind of two different aspects of the business? Because you buy material from other people mm -hmm. that you sell in the store, yeah. and you have material that you have found yourself, yeah. uh, mined yourself. Yeah. What has the experience been like kind of being on both ends? Because a lot of a lot of rock shops mm -hmm. have no claims. They have no self-collected areas. You're purely going to wholesalers or maybe potentially mine owners mm -hmm. and buying for your store. Like you mm -hmm. were talking about of people down in Tucson. Absolutely. I, yeah. I think that obviously you make less money doing that, but it's also easier in a way, right? You don't necessarily make less money either. Hmm. Um, what I've come to realize is the complete circle, um, and, and luckily, as you mentioned, I'm all, I have vantage points of both sides of the circle because I'm, I have a rock shop, I'm selling material, and I'm also mining the material. And so, as a rock shop owner, I have a market that comes to me, and so I may sell some of my, uh, uh, my minerals that I mine myself in my rock shop to my market. But as a miner, if I really want to sell mined materials in any quantity, I have to sell to a completely mm -hmm. different market. And so that's really how I've come to understand this. I have, um, I have something of value in my rock shop, either mined or purchased. And for me personally, in my market, in my rock shop, the people who come in, they want me to understand where the material came from and be as connected as I can be to that material. That's what matters to the people that walk into my rock shop. It really matters. And um, so I take great care and intention in connecting with the material I buy. I meet the miners. I went back a second season before I purchased anything from these particular miners. Mm -hmm. That's how much care I take in it, right? So. You can purchase from them at huge discounts of what that material is worth in a full retail amount. And so you can make a fair amount of money, but you have to buy a lot 
from them and provide to them an ability for them to move mm -hmm. a lot of material exactly like I'm talking about doing. In the, order for me to sell the material I mine, I have to reduce the price mm -hmm. drastically and sell a lot of it to them the so they can make scale. money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's exactly the same for me. They're just providing that same service to me as a rock shop mm -hmm. owner that I'm gonna provide to other rock shop owners as a miner. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what I really have come to understand about how all this works. These are really two separate things. And even though I have material in my rock shop that I mine, I still have to appeal to my market mm -hmm. and be able to provide value to them. And when I go to the world market or to resellers, it's a completely different deal. I sell them tonnage at 20% retail value or I won't move the material. Makes Just sense. like I have yeah. to be able to buy from Ron Coleman's quartz mine mm -hmm. at 20, 30% retail and all the costs that are associated with me getting it and driving there and transporting it and fronting thousands of dollars to buy the material in bulk, that's where the additional money get, comes back to the business owner in their market, right? Mm -hmm. So you can make a fair amount of money on material that you buy because we all sell it as miners incredibly cheap. That's what I learned. I have to sell it dirt cheap, but I'm going to try to move tons and tons, maybe tens of thousands of pounds. That's the only way it'll work. So, so if somebody wants 15,000 pounds of rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. One of the, uh, I had a major online wholesaler, one everyone's heard of, approach me at the Tucson show. And just as a trial, they were interested in buying like three to 500 kilos to see if it would move on the website. And a kilo, there's 2.2 pounds in a kilo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're, you're looking at around a thousand pounds of material uh, just as a tester. So, so that'll give you some idea of the world market. It's just much different. I yeah. would, and as a miner, if I'm going to make my mine feasible, I have to mine tens of thousands mm -hmm. of pounds and put it out on the market. So that's why it's just not a realistic option for m most people. A placer claim um, where maybe they find a little unique mm -hmm. little thing and they can put a placer claim and just collect off the surface. That can be done a lot easier. It's less money, takes less time, less permitting, less commitments. And so load claims are a whole nother ball of wax. You're not putting um, a huge, on a placer claim, you're not putting a huge reclamation bond. Nope, you're not that. allowed to do anything destructive yeah. to the land, so you don't really need a bond. So my understanding of the placer claims, it's not like, you're not dragging a backhoe out there, you're not trenching, you're not do You can't, you, like, you're not allowed. That's, yeah. yeah. you're basically hand tool, surface, surface, surface mm -hmm. kind of collecting, mm -hmm. maybe some you can dig holes on a plastic plane. You, you, I think you're allowed to maybe go three feet or yeah, something. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not much. It, it, it's more akin to like rock, like rock hounding. Like mm -hmm. I ain't digging a giant hole when I go places. Like I'm yeah. out there for four hours, yeah. you know? Um, so yeah, it's a big, big difference between yeah. the two. Yeah. I mean, knowing, knowing what you know now, being mm -hmm. into the several years, mm -hmm. the claims, all the different things we've talked about, mm -hmm. is there any missteps that maybe you took that let's say somebody watching this in florida right now wanting to open up a shop can avoid is there anything that stands out specifically a, a shop yeah um so i think for me personally the most important thing i do for the people who come in and i can only speak for my business i know what makes my business work and if I don't concentrate on providing value to the people who come in, they've got to be getting something of value when they come into my store. Mm -hmm. Whether that's a $10 selenite tower that costs $25 everywhere else and they feel like that's value, or whether it's a parent who brings in a, a, a young person and there's a spark and we have a good time and we talk about stuff they can find in landscaping gravel at their school and maybe that's value, right? Mm -hmm. So for me personally, 
that's why I'm successful. That's why people love coming to my store. And that's why I do well because I concentrate on value and interaction. Did you not and, do that necessarily and, when you first started? Was that something you learned to do? Or did you kind of go into this already kind of having that in your mind? It, it, it became, I think, so my journey personally for me, the reason I even got into doing this is because it started as a personal experience where I was going out and searching for a semi-local agate that we mm -hmm. can find in the area. And I was taking all these day trips to find it. And I discovered wonder and finding these fun moments. And, and what do you know, I was having a bunch of personal growth. And so it sort of just slapped me across the face. Hey, why don't you do this because it's good for you and it's good space for you to be in and it, it's healthy. And it dawned on me that I was connecting with people and something was happening. And so for me, it just became obvious. Maybe, again, I, I don't know if this is something that's going to work for everybody, but you've got to concentrate on providing value to people. Um, if you're not doing that, I don't know that it really matters what your plan is. I, I can, don't think it'll probably I work. Mean, I can kind of speak to that <laughs> a little bit as well. I, I, I definitely agree. I like to think that at least with my videos, the content that I produce, it's yeah. high value. Yeah. I like to think that people can watch these yeah. types of videos and come away from them knowing more than what they started. That's kind of my, I wanna give people yeah. something, yeah, you yeah. know. Well, we've talked about it. it. If you're taking the standpoint of, you know, hey, we're all having this experience together, mm -hmm. let's, um, let's, enjoy it and build each other's knowledge bases and experience this together and versus you know what can i get out of this interaction you know those are <laughs> yeah. just two very different things i, th I think that, it's uh, a long-term perspective versus sh short term mm -hmm. there's i've personally met a good number of people involved in the rock and mineral mining mm -hmm. world that are very short-sighted i feel like you know people think things are money printing machines mm -hmm. and they're mm -hmm. it's really not like you got to be in it for the long haul yeah. and be able to absorb the ebbs and flows of it i yeah. mean at all businesses including this one i assume mm -hmm. has busy days slow days busy seasons you know <laughs> i mean yeah. uh, Pol pullman washington is a definitely a college town absolutely i mean when college isn't in and the kids leave mm -hmm. This town has a very different feel. Yeah, absolutely. No, and we own it. We mm -hmm. we know that, so we embrace it. And and a lot of agriculture, um, wheat fields predominantly, and then the university. That's who we are. And and so you're right about that. Do you ever? I think for a lot of people starting up something, mm -hmm. they have this idea of what am I going to do if it fails? Like this kind of like a little bit of that, like, like mm -hmm. fear in the back of their head where they're mm -hmm. like stepping out mm -hmm. from maybe being an employee mm -hmm. to being self-employed. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice for somebody kind of taking those first baby steps to doing their own thing? Absolutely. Examine your motivations for doing it and concentrate on those motivations being authentic. The reason I say that is I do not believe it will work unless you're motivated authentically. And, and, and we touched on it many times today. The reason it isn't going to work is because it is very difficult to run your own business and undertake something like this. And so you got to want it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. If you don't want it, if you're not willing to fight for it and have hard times, get through the hard times, if you then it might not be the right time, you know, because yeah. you, you, you better be ready to do that if you're going to make it. And that's not to say it isn't going to be rewarding. Um, it's just to say that hardly anything worth having is given to you or easy to get. You know, it's you got to fight for it. And, and if those are your motivations and they're authentic, go for it. I, I agree. Well, well said. <laughs> I could not have, I could not have yeah. said that better. Yeah. Do you have any other things that we should we should talk about? Well, you know, uh, any other thoughts on on this your 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 kingdom of rocks? Here? Oh, you where's know, this I have a question. Well, where is this going to go? Where, where and if I come back in a year, uh -huh. am I going to be seeing more cases? Is there going to be more material in here? Are the rooms going to be done? Yeah, 
Good. I think Good. I, so here's some fun stuff I have on my horizon. I would love to have folks be able to come to my claims and collect themselves. Like a fee day? Uh, yeah, yep. And mm. there's even, on the placer ones, you're not even digging, right? You, there's so much material um, you could access and then um, connect to the pieces that you want to take, right? And there's something that happens when you're collecting the material yourself. There's a bonding that happens and then it's special to you. I have a lot of pieces in my case that are just special to me. Um, and so uh, that's one thing, maybe come into the claims to dig. I'd like to do more interactive stuff, maybe even have some, some fun classes on Tumbling 101 um, or um, uh, crystals, like finding crystals is kind of intimidating to people. Sure, people go rock hounding and look in rivers and mm. dig around, and, but they don't take it so far as to actually find crystals at a crystal dig, right? So I could have um, some troubleshooting and familiarization classes, some things like that where I have people come into the shop. And then the online wholesale stuff is really going to be where the mining business goes. Mm -hmm. In order to move a large amount of material, I'm going to try to develop that wholesale business and, and provide to resellers. And so I'm really looking forward to doing that online. Um, and in the shop, um, just interactive uh, experience is what I concentrate on. So I, I like the idea yeah. of doing some community stuff. Yeah. And you know, have, you have a good space here, I think, to have people come in and kind of see some of it. Yeah. And, I I think YouTube is a great resource for people, but it doesn't beat somebody being like, this is how we cut rocks. Sh sure. Like somebody physically there showing you yeah. Yeah. is far better than watching somebody yeah. do it. The, a necessary the step, you know? though, right? Maybe that's the necessary step <laughs> that gets them to the person. So, mm -hmm. um, But ag agreed. In, in, you, you're seeing the rubber meeting the road is always the best. And... And also, you know, something that I think is fun to touch on um, is what I see that I love so much about the mineral world is it's timeless. And what I mean by that is a six-year-old can be just as into it as a 102-year-old. They can be in the same hole looking at the same rocks in the same place of wonder. And over and over and over, I hear people come in and they say, you know, this has bridged the gap between me and my granddaughter, me and my niece, um, my uncle, you know, that I've never been close with, I found out was into minerals. And now all of a sudden we got a trip planned together, you know, and it's, it's. I, I love I, it. I often frame it like a, <laughs> it's time well invested with other people. It is. You do not remember the TV show you watched two years ago today with yeah. somebody, but yeah. you'll remember the trip that you take yeah. today, two yeah. years from now. Yeah, especially if you got a little rock. Yeah, in your you got window, something so. on the shelf there. You can remember. <laughs> yeah. Jason. Yeah. Thank you so much. In my pleasure. I, I think you you have yeah. helped probably many many people. This is also very enlightening for me. I appreciate cool. you taking the time out of your morning to be able to sit down with us, all of, of us here, My and uh, be able to discuss some of these topics, which, I mean, is not easy. It's not easy to get some people to talk about the, the how the sausage is made. Yeah, And yeah. it's very, very helpful. My pleasure, yeah, absolutely. And and that's kind of how I approach things. If, if, if I can help, I will. And I'm gonna put down below the address here, your website. Awesome. Uh, Facebook's a good way to connect with you as well. It is, and yeah. I assume Facebook's probably the best place to see your current hours if you're... Uh... Yeah, I do. I have a little business page that I run off cool. of Facebook, and we may get some other social media stuff going soon. But as, as for right now, um, Facebook and um, come on into the shop and visit. Lots of people take trips to Pullman just to come into the shop. So. There's a, if you're into CBAs, go watch the CBA video I did with Jason, it's, and uh, it's you're going gonna to love it. It's so enlightening as yeah. far as the CBA world. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much. Excellent. Ed. My pleasure. Awesome. Yeah.